Have you ever worked really hard on something or really hard for something that you daydreamed about, visualized, and romanticized, but when you finally acquire it, it wasn't it was all cracked up to be? Did you yep. feel, uh, you know, a little deflated, a little bamboozled? Like, <laughs> this is not, I've got got. What is this? And this has been me in a number of situations. And I want to share with you today some mistakes that I have made that I wish I was warned about when it mm. came to being a change maker in society, when it mm -hmm. comes to advancing some type of movement, when it comes to being a visionary. And I'm going to be honest, I may hurt some feelings in this episode. I may have mm. in this talk, but the, trust me, I think we have the relational equity where you understand this is coming from a place of love and me wanting to save you, honestly, from pain that you don't have to experience to learn from it. And if you understand and apply these 13 things I'm going to share with you, I guarantee you in some way, form or fashion is going to save you from wasting some type of time, energy and or money on things that you think will give you what you're looking for. But in fact, it's truly just smoke and mirrors. And ultimately, at the end of this, I believe you might have to listen back a few times, but you will become a more clear visionary because of it. You're listening to the Build Your Vision podcast, a podcast about building a life and business you are proud of as a Christian coach, consultant or educational content creator. I'm Clee the Visionary, your host and CVO chief visionary officer and in each episode this show is designed to help you get a little more clear because you can't build or create while you're confused let's go so here we go i'm going to just jump straight into this number one and this is a tough one because it's hard to see sometimes number one is your vision can become your idol quickly if you aren't vigilant your vision can become your idol quickly if you don't remain vigilant what is keeping and taking up the line share of your attention your energy your resources your focus what are those things and if that is not god it is an idol and i know like that's hard to fathom or think about it. it's like I, I got children i got work i got bills i got all these different things of course it's going to get more of my time like we got 18 hours we're awake each day how can i completely give that over to god and i don't think that's the point it's like what is consuming you what are you working on as a means to an end that is replacing god in your life and for me for a period of time, that was my vision. I was like, if this can work, if I can make this come together, things will get better. Everything will be all right. And I was putting it up here and things like my family, things like my spiritual walk and growth were diminishing. They weren't gone. I was still doing it, but like shorter and shorter periods of time until I, you know, had to come to the front. I was like, oh, wow, this is idolatry. So yeah, like being vigilant of that, keeping the main thing, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. That is easier said than done, especially when you have ambition. It's hard. And I don't think you'll be here if you didn't have ambition. So be vigilant that your vision can become an idol quickly if you're not paying attention. Number two, you control your inputs God controls your outcomes. Stop stressing yourself out trying to do God's job. That's right. I said it. Stop it. Just cut it out. You cannot make the rain fall, nor the snow come down, nor the crops grow, nor the wind or the bees that spread the pollen. You don't control none of it, yet you benefit from it every single day. So why are you trying to control the narrative you control the inputs. God controls the outcomes. I'm saving you a lot of gray hair, stress, frustration, 
And this is partially why I'm straying away more so from goals. Because what are goals? If you really think about it, goals are just arbitrary figures that from some form, shape of influence we come up with. How much weight do you want to lose? You, you make up something, 50 pounds. I think that would be good. That's good, right? How much money do you want to make? A uh, million dollars. Where'd that number even come from? It came from nowhere definitive. But yet we bash ourselves for not hitting these goals when we just made them up in the first place. Control your inputs. Say, I'm going to show up every day. I'm going to release a TikTok, a reel, a Instagram, I mean, a YouTube short every day. Like, con control that because you can. And stop beating yourself up on how many views you're getting or how much money you're making. Because you can't control that. And the thing is, the better, the more you focus on the inputs, the better the inputs will be and the better the outcomes will be as a result of your better inputs. But we can become so focused on the outcomes that we don't even make the inputs better. Control your inputs. God controls the outcomes. Number three, your vision will, oof, I feel this one. Your vision will not give you freedom. Having nothing to lose, nothing to gain, Nothing to prove and nothing to hide gives you freedom. That's true freedom. Nothing to lose, nothing to gain, nothing to hide, nothing to prove. That's when you're truly free. And here's the thing. You can have all of that, whether your vision pans out the way you think it should or not. That's what gives you true, not your vision coming to pass. Number four, you're playing the long game. Patience will improve your quality of life. There's a great book that I do recommend called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Comer. Great book. And it really makes you realize sometimes we are rushing and we don't even know why. We're so used to because of, I, don't, I don't know if it's just Western culture or the United States or if you live in New York City, but we we should be in a rush just to be in a rush. <laughs> you, we don't even know why we're in a rush. He's like, I don't know. I just want to get there faster. But you're playing the long game. Dave Ramsey says it like this. We live like nobody else so that we can live like nobody else. You are playing the long game. Patience will improve your quality of life. Control the inputs and remain patient. It took 25 years for the promised child for Abraham to be birthed. 120 years for it to flood Something that Noah had never even heard of before. 120 years. And we're up in arms because our business isn't profitable in the first year. In the first month. Your YouTube short isn't getting enough views in the first couple of hours. Playing the long game. Control the inputs. God controls the outcomes. Your patience will improve your quality of life. Number five. Never stop creating. Hey, Danielle. And Adrian, never stop creating and never sell your authenticity. What's truly on your heart to share? Share that, not what you think wants to be heard. Share that. Great definition of art that I love is being willing to create something that might not work. Being willing to make something that might not work. That is true art. And here's the thing about creativity and art. Don't blame your state of confusion on the fact that you're creative or that you're creating something. Instead, own up to you just don't like to make hard decisions and therefore you're constantly in flux going to back and forth with what you think people might like for you to make. Because a true artist, someone who is really dialed into their creativity of what God has called them to make, will make what they're supposed to make and be okay with the consequences. That's true art. Never stop creating and never sell your authenticity. If you do, you will get burnt out. Remember, those outcomes, if you're making it for the outcome, it's only but so long you can hold on to that. Even if it's working. You could go longer if it's working. If it's not working, you're trapped, you're trapped and screwed. Hey, Teresa. Super glad Hello. to have you. So, oh, my goodness. I'm driving, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to listen in mainly. Good. This is an OG, y'all. Hey, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Never stop creating. Never sell your authenticity. Create what is truly on your heart to share. Number six. Oh, my goodness. 
find employment <laughs> that you enjoy and can support your lifestyle. Here's the kicker. Even if you don't love it, stay employed. <laughs> now, this might skew younger. I don't know. It might not because millennials, I'm hearing some millennials who are in their 40 and they're just quitting. I'm like, wow, you got kids. But anyway, find employment that you enjoy and can support your lifestyle. Even if you don't love it, stay employed until God explicitly tells you to depart and or your personal income from the vision exceeds your employment income. Remember, I said God explicitly. Don't forget that. <laughs> or the vision is, is paying your bills the way your job was. And here's the thing. Here's a reframe for you when it comes to employment while being a visionary leader, because it's hard. It can be very challenging when you have this thing that you know that it could work and that it has some type of blessing on it. And you just want to you just want to go. You just want to go. You can feel like you're being hold back. But here's the thing. You get paid to learn and your employer isn't even your employer. Really think about this. Your, your employer is not even actually your employer. They are. Your employer is an investor with conditions. That's what they are. This is venture capital investing in your vision. All they're doing, your job, your employer, they're just paying, they're investing into your vision. You have built in venture capital. That's what that is. I haven't worked for anybody in years. I'm hiring you. Are you going to be a good investor for my vision? If not, I'll fire myself. That's I'm not exaggerating, guys. You can ask anybody that really knows me. You can ask any of my coworkers in any job that I had. I'm like, they're my, they're my investor. This was my mentality from pretty much day one of me coming to workforce. I'm like, these are my investors. Sometimes I've had multiple investors at once. That's unique, but it makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's just a reframe. It's a reframe that is helpful. That's a topic that I'm very passionate about because like you said, a lot of people are just like jumping ship mm -hmm. after they make their first whatever <laughs> and yes. not understanding that how much your employer really does contribute and that the consistency in income over time is what matters as well in entrepreneurship because you're not necessarily paid the same way that you are when you work a nine to five. So it's yes. not going to be a consistent check. You may get one check for 50K and then, you know, not another one for another two, three months and not another one for another, you know. Yeah. Um, so being able to look at it that way, but also from a business perspective, depending on your vision and how big that grows, if you're going to end up having an organization, study the organization you're a part of. See yes. how it works, the inner work <laughs> of it network, see who you can connect with. Like I work in IT. So it's like, who can I partner with to help build some of my systems yep. and these things? What has been successful here that I can, you know, implement within my business as well. It's a great place to study and learn and develop and grow. Yes. This is, you're getting paid to learn. <laughs> what yeah. gets better than that? Before you had to pay to go to school. Now you're getting paid to go to school. It's, it really is a reframe. And I'm speaking to this from experience. I don't talk about nothing on here that I have not done. I quit my job before. I was like, and this gets to a later point that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you guys. But I was like, nah, this is holding me back. I need to go all in. I started making more money on the side, doing my stuff, doing my hustle. than I was making at my job. I was like, look, I got offered a promotion two weeks before I left my job. Well, because it was my two weeks notice, but like got offered a promotion. They were not trying to give me some things I was asking for. I wasn't asking for like more money and stuff. I was just asking for more opportunities. Like, can I go to a conference? Can I, things like that. Did not budge. They were like, nah. I said, great, I'm out. Now, do I regret doing that? I actually don't. God was doing something in me at that moment. Yeah. I had to learn some lessons in that period when I left my job. I learned a lot about me learned a, a lot about me, but that money I was making on the side, four months in, started to dry up. And here's the thing. Here's the last point on that, on number six that I want to share. You never want to be in a position where your creativity, the thing God has called you to create is being informed by your needs and not your generosity. Say that again. 
You never want to be in a position where your creativity is being informed by your needs and not your generosity. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like that also ties into one that you said earlier about saying like what you're supposed to say and not what you think others need to hear. Because when it's need based, you may feel the need for other people to accept you. And so you want to say what they want to say instead of honoring what God is building and what he has instilled in you to say to the audience he gave you. Yes. 110%. Adrian is on it tonight. Yes. For sure. Yeah. You want to give out of the generosity of your heart, not because, and here's the thing too, when doing sales, when making an offer, right? Selling is not bad. Selling is a good thing when it's done morally and with integrity. You do not ever want to be in a position where the person that you're selling to can smell on your bated breath that you need it. It's just never a position that you want to be in. Yes. You always want to say, hey, here's an offer that I think can help you. If you want it, it's yours. If not, it's okay. I'm not here to persuade you. I'm not here to convict you of anything. But you can only do that if you have investors. So. Yeah. Yeah, that that's point number six. I wish somebody told me that, but nothing has been wasted. I learned and I'll, I'll, you'll hear why going into this. Number seven, <clears throat> no matter how much you think you know, and for those who are coming in later, these are 13 things I wish I had known about visionary leadership. 13 things I wish I had known about visionary leadership. Number seven, no matter how much you think you know, anyone and everyone can teach you something. Anyone and everyone. It could be the infant in the row in front of you at church that is just drooling all over their parent's shoulder, just looking at you, googly eye. You could probably learn something from them. It could be the elderly person. It doesn't matter how young, how old, how experienced, how inexperienced. You can learn something from everyone. If that baby knows something that I don't know, and I'm sure it does, I'm gonna be like, let me let me take some notes. If it's an elderly elderly person that can't even see no more, they know something I don't know. Especially when it goes the other way around. So, especially in the workplace. A younger person who may not be as experienced, may not have the chops, may not have the education that you do, you can learn a lot from them the other way around. And here's the other thing too. You never know who's in the room. Never underestimate anybody. There have been so many situations where I'm just thinking somebody, some just regular Joe Schmo, come to find out they him, she's her. Yeah. I'm like, oh, wow. I did not even know you had all of that under your belt. So just always being a student can get you so much farther. Learning from anyone and everyone, no matter who, how qualified they are or how unqualified they are. Number eight, there's nothing new under the sun. Don't withhold your creativity because you didn't come up with the idea. This is big for visionaries because I'm sure there's something that you want to create There's something that you want to build or something that you are building and you were inspired by someone or something. Every visionary I've ever interviewed has been inspired by someone or something. But lots of times when we are novices and we're just getting started, we're scared to teach on, share, whatever's like, well, I didn't come up with it. So is it okay to use it? Is it okay to share it? And this is something that I definitely struggled with for a while. I was like, well, it's not original. I, I didn't make it myself. I shouldn't. It's not valuable because I didn't come up with it. One, that is a scarcity mindset. Two, here's a newsflash. Whoever you heard it from, whoever you learned it, whoever said it, they didn't come up with it either. They got it from somewhere else too. Nothing is actually original other than God himself. Nothing. We are all building on each other's ideas. Give credit and then make it better. That's how you go about it. I was just giving this analogy the other day of when I was in school, when I was in college, I was really big into music and we used to just have these, we would schedule out jam sessions. Everybody's me, all the musicians, we meet at a place just to jam indefinitely. And it just, all it has to do is someone just starts off with a groove and then the next person riffs on that groove and the next person riffs on that riff and riffs on that riff. And next thing you know, you're jamming. Everything built on something else. Nobody came up with anything on their own. Even the groove that started it all, heard it. you heard it somewhere. It's in your subconscious mind. So don't hold back something that you've learned, something that can help somebody, 
something that could be transformational because you learned it from someone else. Give credit and make it better. There's a great book. I, I recommend this one as well. It's an easy read, short read called Steal Like an Artist by Austin Kleon. And he talks about the difference between like plagiarism and stealing like an artist. Pl plagiarism is taking what someone else did and claiming it as your own. Stealing like an artist is being inspired by something and then saying, you know what? I'm going to use this and I'm going to make it better. Because the thing is like only one fingerprint is like yours. So the way you even share it, <laughs> the way you teach it is going to be different. Now, I'm not saying you teach something and say that you came up with it on your own. Or even make it seem like you came up with no, like I, the thing I just shared with you. I said I learned this from Steel Like an Artist, Austin Cleon. That doesn't take away my credibility as a visionary. In fact, it might it, increase it because it shows that I'm a learned and read individual. Oh wow, they they have a lot of knowledge. They have a huge archive of information. Anyway, I'm slightly behind schedule here. Number nine. Stop implementing advice from people whose life you don't want. Here's a phenomenon for me. People who want to give the most financial advice, maybe this is in black families. I don't know. It, I feel like it's not though. I feel like it's everybody. The people who want to give the most financial advice be the brokest people. I'm like, you broke. Why are you telling me what to do with my money? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> no, I'm not taking advice from you. Oh, <laughs> I don't want what you got. So no, I'm not doing that. But this goes for all types of things, even with people who are successful. The thing is, everyone is poor where another person is rich. Yeah. So you can have all the money in the world, but they're going to see Jeff over there. And Jeff is a joyful person. They will sacrifice anything. They'll pay any amount of money to have what Jeff has. Because he's rich where they're poor. It goes the other way around too. You know? Jeff could be the most most joyful person. Dead broke. Now here, the, it just, you're not in a good spot if you're miserable and broke. Now that's bad. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is, and this, this is something we have to be really cognizant of in the internet age because we have so much incoming information all the time, right? Tweets, the news, social media, YouTube, blogs, internet articles, all these different things coming at us. And here's the here's what sets us apart in this community. We have the North Star of Scripture. We filter all this information through the scriptures. If it don't align up with the scriptures, throw it away. He's he he might be great at real estate, but if he's telling you to work 12 hours, 7 days a week because that's what it takes Throw it away because that goes against scripture. The Bible teaches us to rest. It also teaches you to be diligent in your work, but it teaches you to rest. It teaches us lots of things that go against the culture of today. And culture of today teaches a lot of things that go against the ways of the kingdom. So if you don't want it, I don't care how much she gets in sales, how much she makes on Etsy. If you don't want her home life, take it with a grain of salt and compartmentalize it. Run it through the filter of scripture. Compartmentalize advice and apply it with discernment and wisdom. Stop implementing advice from people whose life you don't want. I had to come to that realization. I was like, man, I'm not doing enough. I got blah, blah, blah. I'm like, wait a second. He don't seem happy. I don't want the bags under my eyes to look like his. You know what? Let me go back to the Bible. See what he got to say about, oh, this is how you're supposed to do it. Okay. Anyway. Number 10, you don't, <laughs> this goes back to the employment thing that I was telling you about before. You don't need more time. You need more discipline. Now that might sound a little cliche, but let me share, share with you why it's not. Your productivity is not determined by how much time you have, but rather what you do and how well you use the time you do have. When I left my job, one of the main things that I felt this first job that I ever had, bachelor's degree, freshly baked. I was like, man, this job holding me back. It's putting a ceiling on my advancement. If I just had more time, I would be more successful. You see what I'm doing right now? And I'm only doing that with like three hours a day. Imagine if I had eight hours a day. 
I'll do this and this. Y'all, let me tell you something. I had not even become the person who knew how to work eight hours a day for myself. Like I, nowhere close. The job was not holding me back. I was my problem. I just wasn't disciplined. I had to have somebody else tell me what to do. I couldn't tell myself what to do and follow through consistently. Couldn't do it. It didn't matter that I had more time. It's, it literally did not matter. You are going to only reach the amount of potential that you are at to that day. Just because you have more time doesn't mean you all of a sudden grow in character. Doesn't mean you automatically just grow in focus, grow in clarity. No, you're going to operate the level that you're at. Point blank, period. This is why becoming the person who could do the thing is so important. Practicing being rather than the doing. Because if you focus on the doing, you'll just be in a state of frustration all the time because you just have not become the person that could do it. It's a tough pill to swallow. It really is. But I had to come to that realization. I was like, oh, the thing that was holding back my business wasn't my external circumstances. It wasn't how much money I had or how much time I had or where I lived. It was me. I was the problem. I just hadn't become the person who could do it. Let me focus on that rather than focusing on everything that's supposedly holding me back. That was a huge wake up call for me. And it allowed me to fully pour myself into things, not thinking that with a scarcity mindset, this is taking a slice of my pie. No, this is a part of the pie. Everything that I'm doing is an investment towards the vision. Even taking care of my family, even being present with significant others. Because if I'm able to do that well, and those areas of my life are healthy, I'm able to perform better when I'm going to work, when I'm hopping on visionpreneur calls. If those places were in shambles, I'll be showing up here half-baked. Everything pours into it. It's not a slice of the pie. It's an abundance mentality that you have to adopt. You don't need more time. You need more discipline. By using the excuse, I only, if I only have more time, it's honestly just a cop-out. We can only create the time we need once we have be, began to become the person we need to succeed. Exactly. And also part of that is clarity. This is why, this is why I'm so invested in this. If you knew exactly what you were going to write on the paper, word for word, you would just write the paper. The reason we procrastinate is because we don't know what we want to write. We're not clear. So we push, we push it off. I'm like, ah, I'll get to it. This is why I'm so invested in clarity because clarity creates speed. It doesn't create necessary speed of outcomes. It creates speed of inputs. You're able to input more when you know what you're going to input. Anyway, this is a digression. Adrian's really, she on fire today. She gave me off topic. She's coming in hot. <laughs> She's been so good. All right, number 11. Oh, wow. I kind of just segued into that. Clarity cures a multitude of sins. That's my personal saying. Clarity cures. I know it's love in the Bible, but this is a remix. <laughs> Clarity <laughs> cures a multitude of sins. Procrastination, overwhelm, laziness, indecision, lack of focus, inconsistency, all of that and more can be cured with clarity. We're overwhelmed because we, we have too much incoming and not knowing where to put it out. Procrastination. Don't know where to start. So I just don't start at all. Laziness. If I knew what I was trying to work for, I would get up and do it, but I don't have any direction right now, so I'll just do nothing. Indecision. I have so many options, but not sure where to put your focus, so you suffer indecision. Lack of focus, inconsistency. You can't consistently show up to some place that you don't know where you're going. Like, how does that work? You got to have some place where you know you're showing up every day. So clarity cures a multitude of sins, and I, I realized that greatly, especially when I had all that free time. I was like, man, I don't even know what to do with my time. I'm not as clear as I thought I was. I'm telling you guys, I lived all this. I'm just sharing it with you as it comes. Number 12, your day starts at night. Oh my goodness, this is so helpful. Yeah, that's great. Your day starts at night. When your day starts in the dark, it gets much better when it's in the light. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. And here's a crazy thing. Like this is, this goes back to, this goes straight back to Genesis one. There was evening and there was morning marking the first day. There was evening and there was morning marking the first, the second day. We see this clearly expressed in the Sabbath day and from the 10 commandments, the Jewish Sabbath day is not on Saturday. 
according to like the Gregorian calendar. It's Friday sunset to Saturday sunset, evening and morning marks the seventh day. So because we live in this society, especially in the West that is fueled by neon lights that keep us up all night and blue light that keeps up us up all night, we operate, oh, the day starts at 12 a.m. There's a reason why that's called midnight. Really, if you want to get more rigid about it, let's just say for example purposes, we know that the sun and the moon operate on a rotating because we're revolving around the sun. But like, let's just say on a just hypothetical basis of being close estimation, 6 p.m. to 6 p.m., evening to evening. Well, what's 12 a.m.? It's midnight. If you go from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., what's in the middle? 12 a.m. It's midnight. If you go from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., what's in the middle? 12 noon, midday. The day starts at night. And when you take this approach, it's life-changing, honestly. The amount of mental calories I would have to burn every morning thinking about what I was going to do, thinking about what I was going to wear, thinking about what I was going to eat. When I do that the night before, when I start my day that night, I mean... You feel you walk, you I'm walking around looking at my coworkers like I am so far ahead of y'all right now. Like you don't even know. Like my day started yesterday. When's your day start? I'm clowning. I'm messing around. But can like, you can you clarify that just a little bit more? Like when you saying you starting your day at night. So like, are you saying you're starting at 6 p.m. as like kind of your day is ending and you're going into the next day? Yeah. So I use 6 okay. p.m. Just because it was a hard set number, because we know, like, especially with daylight savings, the sun sets at different times all throughout the year. But, and it's not necessarily about, it's not, it's more about the principle than the literal time that your day starts before you go to sleep. This is how I, this is how I think about it. My day starts before I go to sleep. So I'm preparing, like I'm already starting preparing for that day. So the beginning of my day is preparation. And I'm going to get rest so that I can execute what I just prepared for. So me going to sleep at night is me resting prepare, resting so that I can execute what I just prepared. So when I wake up in the morning, I'm just continuing what I already started. I'm not saying, oh, this is a new day. What am I going to do today? What am I going to accomplish today? Let me start preparing now. I'm already prepared. And lots of times, let's be honest, those hours before we go to sleep, we are not doing nothing productive. We scrolling on Instagram, watching a Netflix series. We got time. We got time to prepare if you really want to. Now, it's easier said than done. It's simple, not easy, because it takes discipline. But this was, I mean, this changed. It changed everything. I'm able to use my most creative time, which for me is the morning, to actually do creative work rather than getting ready to do creative work. I wake up, I already know what I'm writing about today because I premeditated on it before I, I rested. Hopefully this makes sense. Yeah, well, you know, the first thing that came to my mind when you first initial made the initial statement to this was during the days when I had a newborn and this will predate some of your listeners, I'm sure, when I had to make sure I had enough bottles sterilized the night before so that I that would take one huge chunk out of the next day so that when I had to leave and drop her at the sitter or sitter was coming to the house, that was already done. You couldn't go anywhere unless you knew that you had enough bottles to last the time that you were going to be gone. And so th that got me into pre-preparing the night before on a lot of things that I wasn't yes. accustomed to. Yes. And I went from oh, I'm going to prepare the night before to like, this is the beginning of my day. And that reframe, that mindset shift has been super beneficial. Now, do I execute perfectly every day? No. Sometimes I'm like, bro, I'm tired. I'm going to sleep. And I regret it the next day. I'm like, man, I wish I had prepared. Because I, you feel it. When you don't do it, you feel like, man, I'm just like a step behind. Yeah. You know? So it's really revolutionary. Last one. <laughs> Your memory sucks. Write it down. Write it down, please. This includes journaling. Most of us suffer from selective amnesia, myself included. So 
it's good to have a reminder of where you've come from. I can go back to journals from all the way back to 2016. And I'm like, man, that's what I was asking for back then. I lived that without thinking about it now. Like all these different things reminds us of that the vision is a process. The vision building process is a journey. I mean, lots of times we can have select, selective amnesia. We can only think about where we are right now and what we're building towards, not realizing what we have already built. Also, your ideas, when they come, capture them because they will leave just as quickly as they came. So always have a pen and a pad or always have your phone with your note system ready or your iPad or whatever it is. Be ready to capture those downloads because you think you'll remember like, oh, this is so good. I'm never going to forget this. Okay. And even if you do remember, it just don't hit the same. All right. It just don't. You're like, man, when I had that thing, it was on fire. Now it's like, it's not hitting right. So write it down. Your memory is not that good. No matter how good you think it is, write it down. Besides, you never truly know what you're thinking until you open up to yourself anyway. I forgot who quoted it, who the quote is from, but he's like, I don't know what I'm thinking until I write it down. That is me for sure. I don't know what I'm really thinking until I put it on paper and I can see it for myself. I'm like, oh, that's how I'm feeling. And that goes for anything. All right. So those are the 13 things, guys. I'll quickly go through all of them. Your vision can become your idol quickly if you aren't vigilant. You control your, your inputs. God controls your outcomes. Number three, your vision will not give you freedom. Having nothing to lose, nothing to gain, nothing to prove is what gives you freedom. You're playing the long game for number four. Patience will improve your quality of life. Number five, never stop creating, never sell your authenticity. Number six, find employment that you enjoy and can support your lifestyle even if you don't love it. Your employer is your investor. Number seven, no matter how much you think you know, anyone and everyone can teach you something. Number eight, there's nothing new under the sun. Don't withhold your creativity just because you didn't come up with the idea. Number nine, stop implementing vice from, from people whose life you don't want. Number 10, you don't need more time. You need more discipline. Number 11, clarity cures a multitude of sins. Number 12, your day starts at night. When your day starts in the dark, it does much better in the light. And number 13, your memory stinks. Write it down. And if you don't remember anything I said today, honestly, because I know it was a lot, I can sum it up with this. The name of the game is just never giving up. Consistency isn't about never messing up. It's about never giving up. So if you don't remember anything else, just remember to keep building your vision every single day. This is a long list. So if you want to get this written list plus the recording, you can do that by joining Visionpreneur School. If you're listening to this and you're not already in it, you can get there by going to buildyourvisionpodcast.com forward slash community. That's buildyourvision.com forward slash community. That is a school and tribe of visionaries who want to make a positive impact and income with their ideas, insights, and influence online. You don't want to be outside of this. Really huge leaps and bounds in my life have come from being in the right community. That's it for today, guys. Any questions, comments? thoughts what's on your mind